Michael Webb, we welcome you to our service here. Before our announcements, we're going to sing Redeem in your books, number 458. If you'll like standing, we'll stand. Sweet as a song, I'm singing to
regarding the Appalachia Trinity Christ. Also, we have Ladies Bible Class will be this Wednesday at 10 a.m. And <coughs> Ladies Night Out will be on the 14th. And uh, this is more a reminder for myself, but I'll be going to get Wilma on Tuesday. us 
safe here in America. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you be with them and help take care of them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you give them help to get over some hurdles. Pray, Heavenly Father, for our country. Pray that you help make some decisions that are going to have to be made. We pray, Heavenly Father, that they put you in those prayers and, and, and put you first where you're, yeah. you rightfully are. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you forgive us of our yeah. sins and we pray that you help us live a better Christian life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks now for this cup of fruit of the vine which represents your son's blood that was shed on the cross. And we ask now that you be with the ones that protect the this that when they do so on the man of the young and God's name we pray.
maybe, but you want to go check it out as an adult, come on, come with us. We'd love to have you. That would be a great thing as well. And so um, Scott and Shara are the coordinators for the program here. And if you would like to uh, learn more about it, please see them and uh, talk to them. All right. So that's coming up this year. we got all kinds of fun things coming up this year as well. And one of our uh, our gospel meeting at the beginning of the year here is going to be held by Eddie Clore. And that's going to be happening in the month of March, I think it is, the end of March. And he is uh, going to be holding a meeting on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So he's going to be doing it a little differently than we normally do. But he wants to be here Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And while he's here, he told me very explicitly, he wants to do personal work while he's here. So, that makes my job a little tougher in the sense that now I need to set up a schedule for him. And in order to do that, I need your help. So, if you would like any floor to come to your home and uh, to visit with you or maybe to visit with some of your friends or family members while he is here, please let me know and we can get that set up for the time that he is here. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning is all he's going to be here and then he's going to leave Sunday afternoon. And so, But we'll have a, a wonderful gospel meeting in March and uh, he will be conducting that meeting. And, you know, he comes every year to talk to us about the Truth For Today program that he is involved with. And I'm sure, uh, I know that you love that program, and I'm sure you won't want to miss him uh, speaking to us this year in our first gospel meeting. He does a fantastic job. Well, those are just a few things that are coming up for us this year. And He put us 
in a particular time, in a particular place, so that we could flourish. And now, what else has He given us? A purpose to seek Him. And that's how we need to be thinking about using our new year. Following after the Lord. What will I make of the new year? First of all, I will make it a year of love. We need to be people who practice love within our lives. Of course, when we talk about love, we're going to be talking about our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow human being. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 38, He said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the great and first commandment. So, God wants us to love Him. That's the first and great commandment. We need to have a great love for God within our life. Listen to the way that John would describe our motivation to love God in 1 John 5, 1-3. He says, Whoever, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is begotten of God. And whoever loves Him that begat, loves Him also that is begotten of Him. Hereby we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 1 through 3. The love of God, keeping His commandments. Love God first within our life. That's what we want to do. Make it a year of love for God. Consider Romans chapter 8, verse 28. You know, a lot of times... When people look at this verse, they just think about the last part of it. All things work together for good. Oh yes, all things. But that's not what it says, really. It says, to them that love God, all things work together for good. Even to them who are called according to this purpose. So, all things work together for good to them who love God. That's something sometimes we don't think about in regard to this, and people sometimes uh, cite this verse out of context in relationship to those who don't love God. Well, that's not the intention of this verse. The intention is to show that to them that love God, all things work together for good. And that's what we want to be. Those who love God. Why? So that all things will work together for good for us. If we don't love God, then there is no promise that all things will work together for good for us. We've got to love God in order for that statement to be correct in our lives. And so we want to make this a, a year of love for God. But we also want to make this a year of love for our brothers and sisters in Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9 we read, But concerning love of the brethren, you have no need that one write of you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And so we need to be involved in loving one another. And that love can take many, many forms. And we know many of the forms that that love takes here in the New Boston Church of Christ. As we think about the wonderful potlucks that we have, as we think about the visiting that we do, uh, to one another as we think about how we can help one another when we have needs. That is a great demonstration of love. As we show our love by one another by coming together on the first day of the week to worship God together. Your love for God and your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ should motivate you to be here every Sunday so that we can demonstrate that love for one another so that we can grow in love for one another. Let love and brethren continue. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1. This love needs to be pure. It needs to be unfeigned. A true love. Not just a uh, showing face, so to speak. First Peter 1 and verse 22. Unfeigned love of the brethren. Love one another from the heart. Fervently. That is with diligence. With fervor, with zeal, we need to be practicing our love one for one another. And so, make this a year of love. Love for God, love for our brethren, and love for others as well. In Matthew chapter 
22 and verse 39, Jesus sets forth that second commandment that is like the first commandment. And what is it? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so loving God, loving our neighbor, and we love our neighbor as God has loved us. We, we love ourselves as God has loved us, and so we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. If we love God, and we will know how God loves us because we will be keeping God's commandments, as we noticed earlier. And then, and only then, will we know how to love our neighbor. You know, there's a lot of people in this world today who define love in a different way than the Bible defines it. It's not about keeping God's commandments. It's about satisfying their own lusts and satisfying their own desires. Well, that's not love according to what the Bible teaches. That's selfishness. That's all that is. And one of the great questions that is asked in our society is the question, one of the great religious questions is, what is love? And um, this year, one of the things we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at questions that people ask about religion. And, and I, I found this article that described or that had the top uh, 100 questions that people ask Google about religion. And the number one question is, what is love? And so when we know what love is, then we can practice it within our life. But if we don't know what love is, then we're not going to be able to practice it correctly within our life. Matthew 5, verse 43 through 44, you've heard that it is said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say to you, love your neighbors and pray for them that persecute you. We need to be loving everyone, including our enemies. That tells us what kind of people we are when we love our enemies. It defines us as being uniquely Christian people. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Romans chapter 13 and verse 10 tells us. So let's make this year a year of love. Love for God. Love for our brethren and love for one another. But then secondly, let's make this year a year of service. You know, love itself demands that we serve one another. Look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. For you, brethren, were called to freedom. Only use not your freedom for occasion to the flesh, but through love be servants one to another. That's how we need to practice our love. A serving love, a giving love, a love that is going to uh, exercise putting others before self. That's the kind of love that the Bible teaches, and that implies service on our part. Jesus was a servant. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, found not the being on equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of what? A servant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death. Yes, the death of the cross. There is the example of what it means for us to be a servant. And we are to serve one another. Love, in fact, demands that we serve one another. But then also this, the greatest among us is the one who serves. Think about what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 25 through 28. He called them unto him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Not so shall it be among you, but whoever would become great among you shall be what? Your minister or your servant. And whosoever will be first among you shall be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. See, Jesus didn't come to be served, but to serve. And that's such a great contrast to the mindset that so many have in our society today. In fact, uh, this mindset of being served 
is pretty much the mindset of the world takes. They want to be served in just about everything that they do. Your job is to serve me, you know, and take care of my needs and not leave me one whit about what your needs are. So many have that attitude today. Well, that's not the attitude the Christian is to have, but he shall be a servant. She shall be a servant. That's the attitude that we need to have. Consider Luke chapter 22 and verse 26. But you shall not be so, that he that is greater among you, let him become as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. And so we want to be servants of one another. <coughs> Love the man serves. The greatest is the one who serves. And we must remember what it means to serve. What does it mean to serve? Think about uh, this verse, Luke chapter 16 and verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. So to serve one another doesn't mean to serve one another so that we can pursue uh, worldly interests. It doesn't mean serving one another so that we can pursue a selfishness. That's not what true service is. True service is service to God, recognizing that we only have one master. And what does that mean? Sometimes it means that to serve you, I've got to talk to you about something that you may not want to talk about and that I may not want to talk about for that matter. Why? Because we're serving God first. And that means that we sometimes need to have some conversations that call us to account for our actions and that hold us responsible to the one whom we all serve. And that is, of course, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to serve? It means to seek the best for others according to the will of God, not according to our own personal will. Luke chapter 12 and verse 37, there it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when He comes, shall find Him watching. Verily I say to you that He shall gird Himself and make them to sit down uh, to meet, and shall come and serve them. We need to watch as servants. We don't need to be uh, slackers in the sense that we leave off of doing the work that God has given us to do. We need to serve in the sense that God is our ultimate master and we are accountable to Him. And one day He's going to come and, and we're going to give account of those things that we have done. We need to serve. We need to watch and not uh, uh, give up, but rather to be involved in the work. Matthew chapter 25 and verses 34 through 36. We read there, Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. There is at least a rudimentary list of things that we, as Christians, may do and need to do to serve one another. Are we involved in these things? And that is the great question that we must think about. And so let's make this year a year of service to God. We want it to be a year of love. We want it to be a year of service. And then third, let's make it a year of optimism. A year of optimism. Uh, being positive, having a good attitude toward all things that happen, and thinking about how we can use these things to bring glory to God and to further the mission of Jesus Christ within our lives each and every day. <coughs> occasionally, and I hope you don't mind Justin, but I'm going to use you as an illustration here, but occasionally Justin will put up on Facebook and say, it's a great day to have a great day. And I don't like that. I, every time I see that, I like it. Because what that's saying is, look, there's no reason not to have a great day. The day is what you make of it. And that is so true. It's always a great day to have a great day. 
And we can make it great day if we will be optimistic. The Christian has every reason to be optimistic. First of all, he's been given a life of joy. He's been given a life of joy. Think about Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. Through whom also we have had our access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The Christian has hope. And that's great because that gives him a reason to rejoice. We can rejoice because of our brethren doing the right things. 2 John 1 and verse 4. By the way, I'm thankful that you do the right things a lot in your life. And I'm grateful for the good work that this congregation is doing. I rejoice greatly that I have found certain of thy children walking in truth, even as we receive commandment from the Father. There's a good reason to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Joy. There's one of the reasons a Christian can be optimistic. But also, a Christian is optimistic because he has fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ. And not everyone can claim that. Not everyone knows that communion like we were talking about in our Bible class this hour. We've been made partakers of Jesus Christ. We've been uh, made to be in communion, to be in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that means that we have reason to rejoice. First John 1 verse 3, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you also, that you also may have fellowship with us. Yes, and our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing to know that you are walking with God from day to day because you have fellowship with God. And He is with you and He is on your side. And He is there to help you and strengthen you as you go throughout the day. Yes, God is our fellow, our companion. And we have fellowship with Him. God is faithful through whom you were called in the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 9. Fellowship is a tremendous thing. It's a wonderful thing, a great thing. And we can have optimism because we have fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ. And then finally, as we think about optimism, the Christian has been given this wonderful promise of eternal life. And that's a great reason to be optimistic as well. Simon Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. John chapter five, uh, John chapter six and verse fifty-eight. I made a typo there. John chapter six and verse uh, uh, sixty-eight. So Jesus has the words of eternal life, and we can have that eternal life, and that gives us reason to be optimistic. Verse John two and verse forty-five. And this is the promise which He promised us even eternal life. A great promise that we have as Christians. In hope of eternal life with God, we cannot lie. Promise before time is eternal. Titus chapter 1 verse 2. What a great reason to be optimistic. We can be optimistic because we have great joy. We can be optimistic because we have fellowship with God and Christ. And we can be optimistic because we have hope of eternal life. And let's make this year a year of optimism. Think about these three things that I'm going to make of this new year. I'm going to make it a year of love. Love of God. Love of my brethren. Love of others. I'm going to make it a year of service to God and to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm going to make it a year of optimism because I have joy, because I have fellowship with God, and because I have wonderful hope. And what a great year this will be if we challenge ourselves then to get out of our comfort zones and to live as God wants us to live, not to rest on our laurels, not to look at the past and say, oh, we've done so much already. Why should we keep doing any more? No, no. We're going to be pressing forward. We're not going to give up until the time God calls us from this earth to heaven. We're going to keep on keeping on. That's the way it needs to be. And we need to continue to do that. Not to sell into a rut of past behavior that uh, is not going to get us where we want to go. But rather, uh, instead of being like that one talent man in Matthew 25 and verses 14 through 13 who took that talent and buried it in 
continue doing the things that God wants us to do. Getting out of our comfort zones. Getting into the work that God has given us to do. And being the kind of people He wants us to be. What will I make of the new year? I hope that you will put some effort into this new year, spiritually speaking, so that we can then uh, have fellowship and love and communion with one another and go forward in the great work that God has given us to do. Maybe you are looking for a place to be involved with that great work that God has given us to do, and you want to identify with this congregation so that you can uh, be participants in that work. We'll be happy to talk to you about that. Or maybe you're not a Christian and you're thinking, hey, this is a great time for me to become a child of God and to uh, identify with this congregation so I can be involved in this wonderful work and have a great year for the Lord. Well, if you would like to become a child of God this morning, Jesus said you need to hear His Word and believe it, repent of your sins, confess Him as Lord and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And if you were willing to do that this morning, we will help you to have a great year for the Lord. Of love for God, of service to one another, and of optimism for our future. Or maybe you need the prayers of the church uh, because you have uh, settled into kind of a rut and you're not able to get out of it. And now you, you're looking to spur yourself in a new direction. And now would be a good time to ask for those prayers. And so, if there's a way that we can serve you this morning in doing what God wants us to do together, then we invite you to make that way known. You can come forward and make that known while together we stand and while we sit. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now.
place that we take those words and carry it out into the community in our everyday lives. We also ask now that you look after those that have been on the bed of affliction, those that have had surgeries, and those that have pending surgeries, that you look after them, guide those tending to them, help them to return them to their much wanted health so they can once again worship in the household of faith. We thank you so very much for your son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed all on our behalf. And we ask that we look to him as a symbol of things that we are to do for you. And it's in Christ's name we ask and pray. Amen.